That's an option. But it's not a requirement. And, and, and that's very important. And the example I want to use, in fact, I will talk about a, a cosmology for one or two minutes. Involves, my favorite example involves Georges Lemaitre, who was a Belgian priest, who was also a cosmologist, a physicist. And he was, in fact, the first person to solve Einstein's equations from the expanding universe and show there had to be a Big Bang. And Einstein, in fact, didn't believe it and derided him for a while, but to much to his credit, Einstein eventually realized he was right. It, and uh, Lamette showed there had to be a Big Bang. There was a beginning to the universe. That was a profound shift in science. Up to that point, the scientific consensus was that the universe had been around forever. It was static and eternal. Suddenly, it had a beginning. At that time, Pope Pius got very excited by that fact and wrote a public statement that science had proved Genesis. Now, what did Lamette do? Lamette was a priest. He wrote to the Pope and said, stop saying that. This is a scientific theory, and it makes predictions that can be tested. Now, if your religious and, and metaphysical beliefs suggest to you that it provides a vindication of Genesis, fine. But it could also equally well tell you that you just have the laws of physics that take you back to t equals zero, and you don't need anything else. What you take out of the theory depends upon your religious beliefs. But whether or not you believe in God, the Big Bang really happened. And the same is true for evolution. Whether or not you believe in God, evolution really happened. Now, I want to just spend the last few minutes talking about why ID has been so successful and then, and then go to, uh, to some problems in Washington today. And I think it's been so successful. In fact, it's won the hearts and minds of the people in this country because it, it involved a very good public relations strategy. The idea of open-mindedness. How should we be so closed-minded as just to talk about evolution in the schools? Let's be honest about the fact that most people in this country don't believe in evolution, which is a true statement. Most people in this country don't believe evolution. And let's be fair and allow those people a fair say in, the, in classrooms. Now, I would argue that the, what the public and what policymakers should see is, is exactly the opposite. This is closed-minded, it's dishonest, and it's unfair. It's already closed-minded. I've already shown you the Discovery Institute's open-mindedness. Science is immoral, therefore evolution must be wrong. That's not open-mindedness. Open-mindedness is forcing your beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality instead of the other way around. It's also dishonest. What's the controversy? What's the controversy? Well, when I, when I started to debate them about the controversy, I had a colleague look at a survey of over 10 million articles in over 20 major science journals during the past 12 years. We hit the key words evolution. 115,000 articles came up, and we didn't do an exhaustive study, but most of them referred to biological evolution. Hit the key words intelligent design. 88 articles appeared. However, all but 11 of these were in engineering journals where there's supposed to be intelligent design. <laughs> and of the remaining 11, eight were in fact critical of the scientific basis of intelligent design, and the remaining three were in fact in research journals. They were in conference proceedings. There's no controversy in the scientific literature. Now, when I bring this up in debates, I'm told, well, of course, that's because scientists censor. We don't allow this to be discussed in the scientific literature. And, I, and I, I've given out a challenge which no one has yet to win. I, I've, I've challenged any of them to argue that they've been rejected from scientific journals more frequently than I have. And uh, no one has won that yet. But instead, I said, OK, look, you know, they said, well, we produce books. Darwin produced a book, so we produce books. Well, Darwin also produced articles. But I went to the unpeer-reviewed literature, and I went to Amazon.com. And I uh, did the same thing. I hit uh, the keyword evolution. I came up with 21,822 books and articles on evolution most referred to biological evolution. I had intelligent design, I got 635 hits. Now, about half of these were in fact engineering books, meaning leaving about 300 left, and half of the remaining 300 were critical of intelligent design, leaving about 150 books and articles on intelligent design. Just for fun, I hit the keywords alien abduction. <laughs> okay, I got just as many books. So if there's a controversy that we should be teaching in our schools, if we're going to be teaching about intelligent design, we should be teaching about alien abduction. It's just as controversial. Now, the, it's, it's not only dishonest, but it's unfair. And this is really the key point. Here's how science is done, sometimes. If you're lucky, you have a novel scientific claim. Then you do research, and as Feynman said, you do research trying to prove the claim true and false. Then if you're convinced it's not false, you submit it to a journal and you send it out for peer review. What does that mean? You send it out to idiots. And these people cannot understand what you write. And they come back with silly reasons why, why it didn't make sense. And you write back a response using short words. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and then 
Eventually, if you're lucky, it gets published. But big deal, there's lots of garbage that gets published in the scientific literature. That doesn't matter. What matters is if the idea is good enough that your colleagues start to think about it. And it builds up scientific consensus. And then maybe after 20 to 30 years, it makes it into the high school classroom. That's why high school textbooks are always 20 to 30 years out of date. But what do the intelligent design advocates want? Well, they just want to get rid of the intermediate steps. Okay? They want to go directly from some ill-formed idea to the high school textbooks without doing any of the other steps. And if it re they really do believe it's science, they have an obligation to play on the same playing field as scientists. Now, here's an argument that has been resonated with a lot of people. Look, at least 50% of the people in this country don't believe in evolution. So shouldn't we really be introducing it in the science school classrooms? Now, I want to remind you of that National Science Foundation survey result. 50% of American adults apparently think the sun goes around the Earth. Therefore, should we be teaching the Earth-centric cosmology and physics classes in high school? After all, 50% of the people seem to think it works that way. When you point it that way, the answer is obvious. And the key point that seems to be missed from this whole debate is the important point that the purpose of education is actually not to validate ignorance, but to overcome it. And so if 50% of the people in this country don't know that the Earth orbits the sun, we're doing a crummy job teaching it. If more than 50% of the people in this country don't believe in evolution, we're doing a crummy job teaching it. We shouldn't do a worse job. This should motivate us to do a better job. Now, as my friend Eugene Scott from the National Center for Science Education has said, the First Amendment protects against the government establishment of religion, but that doesn't mean it will protect against bad science. We have to protect against bad science, but in fact, recently, the First Amendment has done a pretty good job, as you all know about the Dover case, which has really dealt a, a huge blow to intelligent design in this country. But, and, and many people would say, okay, this debate is over. But it isn't. This is a, I recommend you read this, by the way, from Judge Jones' this decision. You can get it on the web by Kitz Miller at all. It's 136 pages, triple spaced. And uh, it's humorous and cogent and probably, in my mind, gives the best summary of the st history and the science associated with this pop popular debate in this country over the last 50 years. But while this case was, was decisive and has been very important in my own state and other states in terms of keeping science teaching about science, it's the, the, the issue is by no means all, all over. So in fact, here I just turned on the TV the other day and here's what I heard, saw. No, this is an advertisement for the Creation Museum, a Young Earth Creation Museum in, in near Cincinnati. $27 million museum built with zero debt, which claims to show the scientific story for a Young Earth, a six-day creation 6,000 years ago. It shows dinosaurs in the Garden of Eden. They're vegetarian before the fall, in case you're wondering. And the interesting thing is that this was built in... Um, it, within a pro it was chosen to be in Cincinnati because it was within a day's drive about half of the American uh, populace. And the interesting thing is they hoped to get 250,000 people in the first year. In the first three months, they got 300,000 people that visit this museum. It's incredibly popular. But not only in, is, is it popular there, and, and it, in fact, one has to worry about what's happening in government. And I want to, in the last few minutes, mention a more recent concerns about what's going, and then we can have some questions. As you know, in the Republican debate a few months ago, three candidates claimed not to believe in evolution, and at least one stated they were agnostic about the age of the Earth. In a subsequent debate, one of those candidates said that that was okay because he was not running for a middle school science curriculum developer. He was running for President of the United States. Now, the thing, that's not disturbing to me. The thing that's disturbing to me is that a poll of the public right after that, most people agreed with him. Most people said it really doesn't matter. And that's what should disturb. It disturbs me, and I think it should disturb all of us. Because, you know, it's fundamentally, and I want to get back to this economics in some sense, this is a question of economics and quality of life. And the interesting thing is, you know, when it comes down to it, ultimately,